last week, Nas's new album came out and there is a track EPMD2 featuring Eminem. And in the chorus, quote, my people can't even get minimum wage. Fuck a stimulus. Uh, give me some interest. <laughs> give me some interest. Uh, give me a loan. Give me a home. Get me that land you owe me so I can roam. Jesus Christ. Talk about bars. 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 Absolutely. Bars. I've had that on replay uh, for every gym workout. I don't listen to anything else. Just that one song has been on replay in anticipation. And I time the one rep max of the bench press. I specifically oh. time it. I time it with the bit where he says uh, the interest bar and then get me that land you owe me so I can roam. Just... <laughs> There's a there's a tweet by uh, Yusuf Smith shout out at Propane Fitness where he he trolls uh, new lifters that time their max lift to the to the specific part of a song. So I'm gonna put that up on screen, but <laughs> straight troll, bro. Great tweet by actually Delian at Founders Fund. His younger brother Pavel uh, didn't actually know about Pavel until re recently. Really good tweet I came across. Found out he's Delian's brother. Anyway, tweet says we'll we'll throw it up. The term mental health implies a distinction between physical health and mental health. Your body and soul exist in tandem. They are one. If you're lifting big, eating well, and getting sun, I'd be surprised if you don't feel great most of the time. It's an elite tweet. <laughs> elite tweet. Elite, elite tweet. tweet. Look, look at how I feel and how I just am today compared to, like, let's say, peak COVID a few months ago with the gym's closed and just... To be honest, you always depress me. When I see you, I feel the best. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. And, and also, you, you, are, you are more energetic, to be honest. I, I didn't realize that it was having that much of an effect on you, but it does. Anyway, <laughs> loads of topics to go through. What is the first one? What are we, what are we discussing? You sent me a link about uh, something quite interesting but also weird like i couldn't get my head around it the first time i read about it hacker homes even though i've read about it i still don't kind of get it what, what, what the hell are these and why are they in the news we had these things known as tiktok houses which is where a bunch of tiktokers who would get into these houses together and they would basically create content and the whole point is you're around like-minded people doing similar things. There was actually a very funny troll video of this made by Taymor Abdal of Causal. Uh, it's actually, I, I think it may be his pinned tweets. I'm not sure. But anyway, he made a funny video taking the piss out of like how it would be the startup version. And lo and behold, actually, the startup version started popping up. Historically, the concept is a bunch of people rent a mansion. They they all want to launch a startup. Uh, they find their co-founders. Basically, it's kind of like a co-living situation. So think we work meets living meets, I don't know. If you're older than 35, you'll probably be thinking, what the fuck? Why would you even do that? But if you're if you're young, if you're, let's say, in our age range, age category, you'd probably understand because, I mean, I understand there's a huge shortage of like-minded people all of the people within the tech sector, within the startup sector that me and you have really similar interests with. Uh, there's not many. It's a small community in London and in the UK. And we've pretty much got to know most of them. And it's through doing content, doing rational VC, going just doing stuff. So a lot of it is serendipity. You have to be right place, right time. And these homes do that. So it's, it's as simple as that. A bunch of people get in a house for a few weeks or a few months and they go in either with no idea or a vague idea or just whatever. And then they build, they try to fundraise, they find it's just network. So you get your own room in a mansion, but then obviously everything else is shared. It's got cult vibes to it, right? It's a bit weird in that sense. But then, I, then again, I guess being around people, if, like, if you're serious about building something or you're serious about, you know, I don't know, investing in company, I don't know, you want to be around those types of people. So I get it. And I get that when you're young, this kind of thing is cool as well because you meet new people, like-minded people. Maybe you find, you know, you never know, you might find your spouse there or something. For, for someone who's, you know, you know, late 20s, you and I, it kind of makes sense. Uh, and I guess there is a market there as well because everyone's been in lockdown for the last year and a half. So, it, it, the, you know, the demand's probably increased. I wonder that to what extent it lasts. So, and, and like how... how, do, how Apart from physically being around people, I guess work has showed us that physically being around people is quite important. With, with the last 18 months, people not being around each other actually can be a little bit problematic for work. But overall, the whole working 
remotely does work. So I guess it just fills that niche, which is people that kind of want a little bit of interaction with others, but don't get it through their work environment. Yeah, I see this. Agreed. I see it more with if you're in a commercial role, you're a CEO, you're a biz dev, you're a marketing where you're just extroverted and you just have to be making a buzz and you're out there. But if you're a dev and you're trying to do deep work and, you know, just code, I don't see how it would work. So historically, these would just be a bunch of people rent a place and that's it. A few businesses started popping up where they'd rent the mansion on your behalf and they just rent, you pay like an upfront fee or rent or whatever, and you can stay there. Now, the reason we're discussing this, you can say history has been made in that for the first time, one of these, it's called a launch house, has actually raised millions and it's venture back. As reported on TechCrunch, a trio of friends in May 2020 rented a home in Tulum in Mexico and invited their internet friends. The project was dubbed as the launch house and 18 entrepreneurs came to live there to do the same thing, pay rent, launch projects, build their company in public. Other homes began popping up across the world around the same time. And as a nod to old school hacker homes, but built for the remote work era of the coronavirus. So this progressed since its Tulum origins. Now it's focused on a more cohort based approach. Entrepreneurs are invited to take up a four week live in residency at Paris Hilton's former Beverly Hills mansion, which the company has rented out. So to date, over 200 people across eight cohorts have gone through the launch house to bring their ideas to the seat stage. Here's where it goes beyond the traditional hacker home. The in-person residencies are viewed as an onboarding event into the broader launch house community. Keyword being community. If you're in this industry, you'll, you'll know and we'll elaborate, which includes digital and physical events, services that help with scaling startups and in-house social networks. And it gives a few examples of the high caliber people in a few of these places. <laughs> and then he said, there are tons of important religious sites in the world like Mecca. Oh, and the no, he did it. <laughs> and the Wailing Wall. But you can be a good member of that religion without going to those places. And actually, most people don't. So <laughs> we see ourselves less as a hacker home and more as a venture-scaled membership community. That's a lot of buzzwords, <laughs> if I must say. These physical spaces are just an initial wedge to drive deep connections. Again, more buzzwords. Uh, Joshua Fluke, actually, on site, site Tangent, actually. Um, Joshua Fluke has a great YouTube channel where he just takes the piss out of, like, anything tech or startup or corporate and all the buzzwords like uh, innovate that he rips into Gary V's uh, office tour, for example. <laughs> um, he just rips into everyone. But yeah, anyway, going back to this, wrapping up, while most startups are at the early stage, some have begun to break out and go on to raise from Y Combinator, Sequoia, Village Global, and even Beyonce and Jay-Z. Startups formed at the house include Showtime, Compose, and Calabra, if I pronounce that right. Unlike other early stage accelerators such as YC, Launch House does not take equity in any of the startups that launch out of their community. That's interesting. Great founders have a ton of options. And we think in order to get people into your community, you cannot demand equity up front. It's kind of an uh, you know old school model, outdated. 10x better than we work is what they're calling it. The residency's application process currently evaluates members on three categories. How exciting a person is as a founder, I guess that really is to do with, I'm assuming, your social clout, social capital and clout on the tech Twitter and tech sphere, I'm assuming, how exciting the company is or the idea and how much benefit they would get from joining the community. But we came across something interesting. I don't know if you want to discuss, which is Twitter beef on this. Yeah, Will Manidis, at Will Manidis, uh, <laughs> tweeted saying, imagine raising a $3 million to build a frat house for ex-Google PMs, starting something new in inverted commas. And then about a day later, he tweeted a follow-up to it saying, this this tweet led to two very specific doxes of my address from new and non-accounts. Great culture, guys. Pretty sick. Aside from the serious element of like people not being able to take a fucking joke. But the, the brilliant thing is, a reply in his, in his thread is from Gabby Goldberg, Gabby underscore Goldberg. It says, is Teal Fellowship not in your bio right now? And then Turner Novak, the ultimate troll, VC's troll of trolls, came back to say, have not been able to get a hold of the fire department at all this afternoon. And honestly, I think I think what it is, is that people are, people. some people will get it and some people will really take benefit from something like this and some people won't and that's fine. But trolling it is fine. Like we are here to troll, do it. It's funny. I mean, people, we get trolled all the time, but yeah, it's- Well, you get it's, trolled all the time. <laughs> <laughs> If it's, if it's for you, go for it. Go to a launch house. If it's not for you, don't go to it. It's pretty simple as. I don't think there's much else to discuss. What's the next topic?
Tesla AI day, robots are coming to serve your every need. Famous people in the AI space are coming out and saying, what the hell, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So we're recording this uh, on Friday the 20th of August, which is in UK time, basically a day after this went live. Uh, Lex Fridman, obviously everyone knows Lex um, from his podcasting, but he's also sort of an AI expert. He, he goes on and says, he tweets, he says, Tesla AI Day presented the most amazing real world AI and engineering effort I have ever seen in my life. Yes, he's a little bit biased in the sense that he absolutely adores uh, Elon. He's his friend, yeah, they're mates. He's got a point. So there's there was a lot of takeaways from this and it wasn't just the headline, you know, Tesla bot, essentially a humanoid robot that is meant to be weaker than the average human. Uh, literally, this sounds like the beginning of a sci-fi sci -fi movie, but uh, it's meant is designed to be weaker than the average human and is essentially being designed to run everyday kind of boring activities that people can't do or don't want to do. There's a there's a whole like bunch of takes on that humanoid bot, but there's other things they've done as well, which are really, really cool. They've essentially unveiled a new chip to train their essentially dojo uh, supercomputer. Um, and it's called the D1 chip. It's meant to be ridiculously cool, 50 billion transistors. Uh, apparently it's got 11 plus miles of wires that have helped develop it. It's built using seven, seven nanometer technology. Now we, we're not gonna get into the details of the technical elements because we're not experts in this space, but essentially it's a significant step forward to what Tesla can do with its everyday activities across its span of products. So it's essentially enabling a level of AI development within their business across all their products in one single way through their supercomputer that will essentially improve the value and make far better uh, the products that they currently sell. It solves a lot of the computer vision problems and it improves the sort of full self-driving system of Teslas because what we've been seeing a lot is a lot of criticism of the self-driving or the autonomous uh, aspect of Teslas and a lot of reports over the last few years of uh, accidents or you know people's lives have been lost or whatever's happened there's been a huge amount of criticism but this is going to correct for a lot of those using this vision based approach uh, it uses neural networks to ideally allow the car to function anywhere on earth via its autopilot system. Their head of AI basically said <laughs> about the architecture, he said, we're building an animal from the ground up. So what it does, it moves around, senses the environment and acts intelligently and autonomously based on what it sees. Whereas right now, how it works, Tesla, Tesla drives, it goes through a new road and it says, oh, I've never been down this road before. And it sends that data of the curvature and the uh, gradient and whatever of the road, it, that goes back to Tesla as data. And then Tesla, obviously, is sort of collecting all of this data about different roads around the world. That's it, basically. And that's why next time you drive down, let's say, Regent Street in London or whatever, because so many cars have already been down that road, or at least one car has been down that road from Tesla, their data has obviously picked up the positioning of the roads, the layout of the roads, so the machine has learned uh, for the, those who are extremely non-technical, where machine learning comes from. So the machine has learned from previous experience how to act in the future or how to go about the task ahead of it in the future. So, But the problem with that is, of course, it's not super accurate. We've seen accidents um, and there are better ways and beyond you know, our technical understanding as well. We'd actually, we're going to get someone technical on at some point to explain all of this. But beyond all of that, this basically solves for all of those issues. And then to, to go back to the bot, which is the thing that I guess caught everyone's attention, a new humanoid bot. I guess that bot will be able to develop over time as well through that learning mechanism that is being provided through the method of the D1 chip through the Dojo supercomputer. We'll, we'll pull up on screen some of the things that it does, but Tim Urban did a, did a great thread while Elon was talking and he's put down what Elon said. Elon says, our cars are semi-sentient robots on wheels. It kind of makes sense to put that into humanoid form to automate dangerous, repetitive or boring tasks. You can run away from it and most likely overpower it. Hopefully that doesn't ever happen, but you never know. One of the stats that's in the picture that's been screenshotted <laughs> is the, how much the bot can actually deadlift. It can deadlift 150 pounds. 
I don't know if Tim Urban is on the notorious block list of um, Nassim Taleb, but if if he's not, Nassim probably f- fuming right now, seeing 150 pounds is the only amount that that bot can can, can deadlift. We've been seeing as a result of this a lot of a huge demand for AI policy as a career path. Um, 80,000hours.org, I believe, is the site we've uh, shouted out before. Uh, they actually have a bunch of articles on fulfilling careers of the future. You know, if you want a fulfilling career, you spend 80,000 hours of your life working in a career. Uh, you better pick something that is good or is giving back to the world. So the notion of you earn to give, which is high paying careers, or you go into something which just directly helps. And so the, one of the careers which they're really rating highly for the last few years is anything in AI policy. But it's interesting because Elon specifically spoke about this, right? He was like, this, I think, will be quite profound because what is the economy at the foundation? The economy is essentially labor. So what happens when there is no shortage of labor? And what he's saying is essentially there'll need to be universal basic income as a result of that, because at some point, whatever that labor is that we currently do is going to be replaced by humanoid robots. So what he essentially says is in the future, physical work will be a choice. So policy that helps drive that is is. Yeah, it's going to be important. This was discussed by, we've mentioned this book so many times, but Matt Ridley in The Rational Optimist, he explained and highly recommend everyone reads that book. This was written 10 years ago. He said in in the next century, so many tasks will be automated, which I think will be much quicker than the next 100 years. But so so much of the tasks that people do now as day-to-day jobs will be automated that will leave people to then do what going back to your point of universal basic income then leaves people the people who are in the creative industries will flourish which is why shout out to naval ravikant for the million uh. time. <laughs> shout out naval as always but his whole book on go and read naval's book or his tweet thread or podcast or whatever he explains using leverage using code or media which is the highest form of leverage you can push out something creative which earns while you sleep and these are things which you get rewarded for actually being creative bringing specific knowledge as he says that's the way the direction the world's going in so that's why we're seeing among the tech nerds why many of us are podcasting, writing, coding, which can withstand the test of times despite AI and autonomy. As uh, Jay-Z once said, uh, you can pay for school, but you can't buy class. I will change Boss. that to, I will change that to, you can pay for school, but you can't buy charisma. It doesn't quite have the same, you know, uh, but That's why you're not a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my point is bottom line, productize yourself. That's basically it because then you'll be, somewhat you can say anti-fragile in the next few decades if you've productized yourself from now you've laid the groundwork you've laid the foundations and that's the direction the world's going and a lot of shit will be automated so it's it's about you as a person have you productized yourself from the future of ai to the future of space i want to talk about bezos so following the project jedi defense cloud problems that emerge from 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 giving uh, cloud contract for the defense space to Microsoft only as the sole cloud operator. Fresh off that, Bezos is now suing another very famous government agency, which is obviously NASA. Um, oh, Jeffrey. Jeff is, yeah, apart from the Botox that is used on his face, which look, realistically, I'm, I don't like commenting on people's appearances, but like his face is like, yeah, long story short, I don't know if it is Botox or not. I don't know, man, but it just didn't look very, very natural. But that's a separate point. The guy is going after NASA saying there was fundamental issues with a $2.9 billion, about £2 billion lunar lander contract uh, that was provided to SpaceX. So obviously Elon. This dick measuring contest needs to stop. And it, it, it's hurt in the innovation, right? It's not, it's not helpful to where this industry goes because there's enough of an industry, there's enough of a market, there's enough of a growing market for both of these companies to not only survive but thrive. And I don't know, maybe he's trying to make a point with the fact that the process was unlawful and improper in their evaluation. So maybe there was, right? But at the end of the day, it's a $2 billion contract and like that's a drop in the ocean for this guy's personal wealth, let alone what he wants to do at a, as, at a business level. So I don't know, I just wanted to bring it up and just say, stop the madness. Like, I think I think this beef was probably not not a beef, but whatever pettiness is going on, was probably kicked off by Jeff. We've seen Elon Musk; he's gone out to Richard Branson's launch a few weeks ago to support him, and he's very much uh, with a lot of the space tech startups. He's always 
sort of meeting, mingling, supporting, advising. So I think this is probably, this is Jeffrey has just been a bit salty, um, but we don't know the backstory, but it would be great if we saw more positive sum games in this scenario, because this is, there's not many people doing this. There's very few, you can count on one hand, the big names, the Branson, Musk's and Bezos trying to, uh, you know, revolutionize this whole interplanetary and I don't know, space travel and all this shit. So just fucking work together, you bastards. Let's get them on the pod. <laughs> <laughs> just give them a few hours to, to, to I, work I like all of you. I, I like all you guys. So just work together. Anyway. Next thing, IPCC. There's been a report which has made massive waves in just general news, in like public life around climate change. Um, We'll keep this one brief because I think most of you will be up to date on this, but it is a 200 plus author report, right? 200 people have essentially provided input into this. It is essentially a summary for policymakers, if that's one way to put it, around what climate change is doing, um, what the actual facts are telling us and what the future will look like if we don't do anything. It's a damning report. It's scary to read. And if you do read the whole thing, you come away with a sense of negativity, not positivity that we tend to see in the venture space uh, or an early stage space around finding the solutions because we've left it so late. And of course, venture will always play, play a massive role in supporting this early stage change and bringing down the cost of different solutions that will help you know, get us out of this hole that we find ourselves in. But there's five major things that I wanna bring up about it. But the first thing is that, uh, you cannot say that climate change doesn't exist because it's been the hottest uh, decade, this last decade, in the last 125,000 years. This is not a joke anymore. This is actually very clear that humans are having a direct impact on our planet. The second thing is that we can, instead of saying, oh, you know, we, we think that um, these new hot weather patterns or these tornadoes or these rising sea levels, etc., could be attributable to climate change. Actually, now we can prove it through new scientific methods of measurement. Even 20 years ago, this wasn't possible, but now we're being able to do it. The third thing is that basically scientists have narrowed the estimated range for how temperature responds to greenhouse gas emissions. So building on that fact that we can measure it, we can now say that what the range of that uh, change is. What we also know as the fourth thing is that if you do start doing things well, even in the short term and at a small amount, the earth rewards what they say is good behavior. You can reduce temperature over time. You can ensure that carbon in the atmosphere is reduced through carbon sinks. But what you can't do is reverse things like rising sea levels because once you open that can of worms, you can't turn it around. The final thing is that the scientists, all those 200 people that come that have come together and said all of this stuff, what they have built with this is consensus. Consensus that has exist in, existed in isolation, but now we have it in one place. And essentially by doing this, they've brought all the UN governments together. And all the UN governments essentially are agreeing with this. So now we're getting to a place of harmony, you know, better late than never, but it's a good thing. So those are the five main things I wanted to bring up. So for someone who's been around some of the biggest names in UK, Europe, uh, boardroom CEOs, management teams in this industry. Me as a, what some call an absolute barbarian when it comes to lifestyle choices, what can I do to help? Because I'm not going to do all this veganism bullshit. I eat a lot of, I don't eat factory processed, whatever I eat, you know, from farms like grass-fed beef, Dell's food, whatever. But beyond that, like, and I like to fly, but not, not, not often. I'm not fucking Bezos. So what else can we be doing? And shout out to actually, we have a friend who, Nima Shakib, who has an, an app called Carbon, C-A-R-B-N.com. It's a fantastic app. They raised some funding and they're doing some tr truly awesome things essentially an app for you to track how you have basically to put it in, in my words, how you're fucking up the world, how much meat are you eating, how much flying are you doing, how much all of this, how can someone who lives like this also live consciously with what's going on in the world with everything you outlined with how fucked up things are. Yes, there are going to be a lot of top down measures put in place that as you outline, but bottom up, how can we help make change? There's a lot of things you can do. The, fir the first I'd say is 
a lot of people say this and I don't know if I I understand where it comes from because I understand the amount of carbon that's put in the atmosphere from uh, meat farming, particularly beef farming, and the amount of actual land that it takes to do it as well is reduce beef consumption. To the extent that you can tell someone what they should and shouldn't eat, I think it's a good you know, option on the table and it actually has a massive correlative impact. So like for the small amount of, let's say you eat a steak a week, right, which you're probably bored. I eat steak every single day, but reducing your your beef intake will have a major impact that is outsized to the difference that it will make in your life. It's a small change in your life, but it will have a huge impact. The other things you can do are um, switch to a green energy supplier. If you look at people's, if you look at energy supplies in the market, a lot of them will say they're green. However, what a lot of them are doing is they're buying back carbon credits. So they're essentially displacing carbon. Uh, for any carbon that's you know created from them providing energy to you through fossil fuel methods, uh, fossil fuel sources, the they'll like they will enter contracts or buy carbon credits such that you know a carbon sink is created somewhere, i.e. trees are planted somewhere in the Amazon as a result. So they're offsetting that carbon usage. Make sure you choose specific suppliers that are cr- giving you green energy that comes from green sources. Apart from that, you can also you, there's loads of things you can do that are small, like make sure your lights are turned off, make sure you're using the train instead of a plane, make sure if you can, you're cycling. Um, and these things are good for you as well, as opposed to, you know, being random stuff. That, but these are conscious decisions that you make. Buy less fashion, like especially fast fashion, like buy less clothes. Like these are little things that you can do and they're things people know. It's just that you need to be kind of pushed in that direction. Apps like Nima's, you know, carbon app is actually very useful in doing that. You can actually, I think there's B2B versions of it as well. So you can get your employer to add this to your company as a way of uh, gamifying and, and, and creating a, a game within your organization to help drive this. I, I think I think they're, they're powerful methods. Well, this wasn't intended to be a plug for carbon, but now it is, so check it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The final thing I want to pick up on is I've been itching to talk about this. I know you've been itching to talk about this. Uh, it's porn. <laughs> it's not really porn. It's OnlyFans. Um, I heard Subway is hiring. <laughs> OnlyFans, man. What's happening? They came out today. So Friday, the 20th of August, 2021. They've come out and said that uh, because of some pressures from some financial institutions, which handle their payment processing, that's the official reason, they essentially have to stop what they call, you know, inappropriate or hardcore levels of pornography on their on their site, which is mad because, uh, in my view, it's pretty much what drives all of the revenue. What the fuck is going on? When you compare the valuations that some other tech companies are getting or SaaS companies are getting, yes, you can argue, let, let's forget SaaS because you're going to argue that it's recurring revenues, but this is recurring as well. A lot of people on OnlyFans, they pay on subscription models apparently. And so... When you look at the difference in valuations, it's it's the multiples are absolutely ridiculous in how OnlyFans uh, gets gets just destroyed. Uh, they're not getting what they should be getting, but then that's understandable. It's absolute bullshit. I've seen this tweet which says, whatever you think of anything else to do with OnlyFans, this new ban leveraged by big payment processing companies is a frightening infringement on freedom that you should definitely not be celebrating. A big, a big principle is in play and lots of people are getting fooled again, blah, blah, goes on and on. His point is valid if you're talking about other things such as, you know, earlier last year, there was issues with, you know, people getting their accounts deleted on Twitter and things like that. I, I completely side with them that we need all, some alternatives. We need backups on, let's say, whatever you want. Some people say blockchain, some people say another platform. Uh, like the signal app came out because of WhatsApp privacy concerns, whatever. I totally get it. And I agree. But when you're talking about this, this is very different. And I'm disregarding the rest of his thread because this is, we're talking about, this is essentially sex work. You look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you understand that beyond the basics, you get to a point where you need love, affection, or, you know, someone, despite all of this, as Wahid, who I recently connected with on Twitter, I will throw up this tweet. And Tariq, actually, Tariq Ismail, he, he posted a tweet which said, This graph is scary with or without the pandemic. Is loneliness just a way of life as you get older? And Wahid then uh, retweeted that and said, hyper-individualism and a breakdown of traditional family structures means places like the UK have appointed 
a minister for loneliness. You can't make this stuff up. Google it. With all of this uh, hyper sexualization of everything, if you want to call it the, as Aaron Clary calls it, you know, enjoy the decline of the West. This is brainwashed uh, society, brainwashed a lot of people. And so everything has been hypersexualized. People are lonelier than ever. They have this need. They go on these platforms. It's ruining, it's further decaying society. These men who should be further improving their lives, building, it's not their fault. Their dopamine receptors being damaged by a bunch of robots and soilennials in Silicon Valley who are playing with algorithms to get more clicks from them. The whole thing's a shit show. No, I fully stand for this. Uh, I think it's fantastic. It's the end. But the problem is you end only fans. People are going to go elsewhere. Something else is going to pop up. Someone else is going to say, wow, there's $300 million of profits per year on the table. I'm going to go and take it. Why not? So my point is on a macro lens, uh, the, this is fantastic. Um, but unfortunately, there's going to be alternatives that pop up. This industry I despise because it's, it's made men weak. There's a lot of funny memes or pictures, which I'm sure you've seen, which says men in the 50s or 60s, and it shows the most fucking alpha male figure with like, he would go to war and earn a living for his whole family with a ripped physique, strong mental state, strong physical state, strong everything state. And then it says, it shows a photo of men in modern day, and it shows a photo of genuinely the biggest simp moving away from the tangent that we just went down in terms of psychological and human impact of only fans that's what we cover <laughs> the, the interesting thing about only fans is that a day or two ago it came out i don't know if it came out or it was leaked that the company is essentially scaring off venture capitalists and it was struggling to raise capital and part of the reason was that obviously only fans has like a porn problem right it, it's essentially a platform where people sell porn as, as as you as you mentioned but never once in its pitch deck did it actually talk about selling porn and that's why from the off this british company came across as being disingenuous but what you could argue against everything you just said is that fine only fans exist it doesn't matter it's behind a paywall and there should be enough there should be enough regulation but not necessarily from the government but in terms of self regulation that stops these uh, platforms from emerging and and the thing with only fans is that it blew it blew because as as with a lot of tech companies over the last two or three years it blew because of the pandemic and people actually being lonely and everyone has known since as you mentioned you know from the beginning of time the the oldest the oldest uh, profession being sex sex sells and and we know that sex sells because from their numbers we see a sh they, they are making a lot of money right so their gross merchandise value OnlyFans is gross merchandise value, which is essentially the amount of money that is that is um, that moves from peer to peer in this space. I.e., it's a C to C platform, a customer to customer platform. The amount of money that goes through there went from 2.2 billion in 2020 in FY20 to 20 to 5.9 billion in FY21 to 12.5 billion in 2022 in FY22. And, and net revenue also increased to about two and a half billion. But what's super, super interesting is that $3.2 billion has been paid to those creators on the platform since its inception. And 300 creators earn at least $100 million annually. Uh, sorry, $1 million annually, which is $300 million in total that a, like a tiny proportion of, of creators on the platform create so there is a value generation aspect to this that is emerging there is a healthy profitability and healthy financial situation that that this company has and it's well managed in the sense that it has been able to get to this point and leverage whatever's happened in the market and what's also interesting is that even with all of this even with the fact that it's multiple should be sky high even with the fact that it's a self-regulating self uh, perpetuating platform that people that customers sell to other customers it's essentially a marketplace even though that all of this exists venture still stays away because of a lot of the points that you raised but also because i think that a lot of the lps of these companies a lot of the lps of these venture funds do not want to be involved and seem to be involved with what is termed as sort of cd investment profiles and i think s something there is not to write I think I understand the societal impacts of those and I, and I understand that, you know, 
some people just don't want to invest in this for religious reasons or societal reasons or whatever. But as you mentioned earlier, from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I think the third one on the third rung up is love and relationships um, beyond your food and physiological needs and all of that good stuff. There are people, there is demand for this. So unless you solve the root problem, which is society's issue with men not being able to, or even women not being able to fulfill their um, sexual or love you know, or friendship needs, these things will always emerge and they will always be beneficial to society in an, an isolated way, um, given that they're essentially supply for a for a growing demand. So I don't know what to think of it from a moral perspective, but I, I know that from a financial perspective, it makes sense and, and they should be getting more, they should be definitely getting more investment than they are. Let's just end on this. I took a phenomenal screenshot from probably we've, we've mentioned it almost every episode for like the last few episodes antonio garcia martinez his you love this guy <laughs> i like we're gonna get him we're gonna get him on the pod at some point his book chaos monkeys which in my view is a classic it's like people be like shut shut up it's like, like it's a, for me being in this industry it's a classic and i took a screenshot we'll throw it up he said as every new arrival in California comes to learn that superficially sunny hi they get from everybody is really, fuck you, I don't care. It cuts both ways, though. They won't hold it against you if you're a no-show at their wedding, and they'll step right over a homeless person on their way to a mindfulness yoga class. Facts, facts. It's a society in which all men and women live in their own self-contained bubble unattached to traditional anchors like family or religion. This is the key part. This is because I've actually been studying a lot around concepts of religion and what the traditional values that we've lost, as I said earlier, unattached to traditional anchors like family or religion and largely unperturbed by outside social forces like income inequality or the Syrian civil war. Take it light, man, quote unquote, elevated to life philosophy. Ultimately, the valley, the Silicon Valley attitude is an empowered anomi turbocharged by selfishness, respecting some nominal feel good principles of progress or collective technological striving. But in truth, pursuing a continual self-development refracted through the capitalist prism, hippies with a capitaliz capitalization table and a vesting schedule. Put some horn sounds, some, you know, they do in hip hop songs, like the DJ goes. Bruh, bruh, bruh. <laughs> a lot of what he says is specific to the US and within the US specific to the Valley. Within so the US specific to the Valley, but a lot of what he said, I'd also apply to this whole OnlyFans and sex and online industry as well. This is going to sound ridiculous, but yeah, it fundamentally comes down to choices, right? And if, if you want to be involved in the space, be involved. If you don't want to, don't. Much like what we started the podcast with about new age Google level frat houses or, or hacker homes. I, I, I think if you care about it, fine. If you don't want to be involved in it, fine. Only fans the same. Okay, fine. It has societal impact that we probably can't see today, which makes it a little bit more dangerous. But at the same time, like, you know, it is what it is. Like, this is life, unfortunately. And this is what's happening, particularly in the US at the minute rationalvc.com go and read some free essays it's online you don't have to subscribe but i'm sure you'll like it so much that you'll subscribe anyway you can join over a thousand seasoned founders vcs investment professionals who get a monthly essay in their inbox completely for free and nothing else and uh in my best efforts for my to contain my persian salesman uh in a bazaar uh i try not pitch it any more than that and anything else you want to add? Persian salesman, look at you. You, you look like a, a Persian builder more than a salesman. You yeah, yeah. even got the necklace. Oh, for Christ's sake. Um, no, shut it looks down. good on you. Drop skeps are shut down to end this podcast. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll, we'll get copyright claims. Let's just end it there. All right, <laughs> thanks. Catch you on the next one. Peace. Peace.